like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. I got Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar. Thanks for joining us today. It's our privilege to have Professor Charlotte Sueta with us today, and I will introduce her in a, in a few minutes. Um, I also have an important message. Um, after today's webinar, you will need to sign up again in order to attend future webinars with us, because we have to change the registration platform. The link um, for signing up will be posted in the chat room, so have, it, have a watch there. And at the end of the session, uh, we will also um, chat it again. And alternatively, of course, uh, please follow the instructions in our weekly emails and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. I would also like to remind you to use the Q&A uh, function uh, to send us the questions after you have after um, the chat with uh, Professor Charlotte Sueta. But now it's time to hear from Bibek Wanwali, uh, a very talented research fellow at our Center for Healthy Longevity. He will talk about the prevention of cognitive decline in aging people who are at risk uh, of dementia. Bibek. Thanks, Andrea, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. As Andrea mentioned, I am Vivek, a research fellow at Center for Healthy Longevity, NUS. Today, I am going to talk about the landmark paper on cognitive neuroscience and lifestyle intervention. The study is very well known finger study by Professor Mia Kevi Pelto from Finland. Dementia, along with cognitive impairment, has become one of the most important public health concerns. Furthermore, Dementia is also a major cause of disability and dependency among older people worldwide. With increasing number of elderly populations, the person living with dementia is increasing rapidly, and it, it is expected to reach 125 million by 2050, which will have significant socioeconomic repercussions. Studies have shown that modifiable vascular risk factors, lifestyle risk factors, such as high blood pressure, high blood cholesterol, obesity, alcohol consumption to be linked with increased risk of cognitive impairment and dementia. FINGER, the Finnish geriatric intervention study to prevent cognitive impairment and disability is two-year population-based multi-domain double-blinded randomized control trial, where 2,654 individuals from six different centers in Finland were recruited. They were randomly assigned into intervention and control groups. Those people in control groups were given general health advice, whereas those in intervention group were enrolled into a specific Nordic diet program, physical exercise training program, computer-based cognitive training program, as well as they were monitored for vascular risk factors. The primary outcome was change in cognition, which was measured by detailed neuropsychological test battery. Over the follow-up of two years, those individuals in intervention group showed significant improvement in cognition, more specifically on executive function, processing speed, and memory. There was also reduction in other chronic diseases. Over the follow-up of two years, those individual, individuals in intervention group, only 46 participants 
reported any adverse event. The most common adverse event was musculoskeletal pain. Findings from this large long-term randomized controlled trial study suggest that multi-domain intervention could improve or maintain cognitive functions in at risk elderly populations from community. Hence, we need to modify our diet and lifestyle in order to prevent or reduce cognitive impairment and dementia. Furthermore, with no promising results from other drug trials, there is need of clinical trials involving lifestyle interventions such as diet and exercise. Ever since, finger study has been adopted worldwide in other countries as well as, well as worldwide finger network. Singapore and US is also a part of this network. Thank you. Thank you, Bibek. And I would advise you to also look at the video of Professor Christopher Chen, where he describes the Singer study. So an equivalent of the finger button in, in Singapore. But now really we have to go to, to Charlotte Sueta, who is a professor of geriatric medicine at the university in Copenhagen and the head of geriatric research at the affiliated uh, university hospitals. And her research, and I know her from her research, uh, she is focusing on aging muscle, including sarcopenia and the role of physical inactivity, which is, uh, of course, a very important uh, problem in the time of, of a pandemic of COVID. In 2019, she was the co-founder and she was appointed as head of Copen H, and that is Copenhagen Center for Clinical Age Research. And the center really wants to link basic research with patient-centered clinical research. I'm very fortunate now to introduce you uh, to Charlotte, and I would really like to hear if it's really disuse, so our sedentary behavior, or is it aging? Charlotte, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrea, and um, I'm really grateful for this uh, chance and the invitation. It's a big honor to be here. And um, yes, as you said, I'm affiliated to the hospitals in Copenhagen, but actually my background is in sports medicine and exercise physiology. So I'm thinking of myself as kind of a sports geriatrician, and I think uh, uh, my, um, my presentation today will... Um, will show that. So uh, I will try to share my screen with you. I thought an interesting title could be loss of muscle mass at old age. And we um, think you're all aware uh, of uh, the importance of that. And um, if it's caused by disuse or really aging, and I'll try to address that in my slides here. So um, the whole presentation will be about muscle, skeletal muscle and how that is affected by aging. And uh, you're probably familiar with this guy. And uh, normally um, um, we address muscle in another way. So just to emphasize the importance of muscle, I will. Uh, I think it's interesting to, to think of it in the way that we have a lot of muscles. Skeletal muscles accounts for about 40% of our total body mass. And we have more than 600 different muscles. I think it's 640 actually. And what is uh, very essential about this muscle tissue uh, that uh, is that of course it's crucial for our locomotion uh, and uh, for um, an independent lifestyle. If we can't move independently, we can't live an independent lifestyle. And we know from, from a lot of um, studies that it, this is actually the most uh, important uh, point for life quality for older individuals. Apart from that, muscle mass and muscle health is also extremely important for our metabolic function and also act as a reservoir in catabolic conditions. So in the other hand, if we don't have a good muscle health, uh, we may get sarcopenia and um, increase our risk of uh, falls, physical disability, um, diabetes, osteoporosis, and a lot of other uh, uh, different diseases. And um, also actually increase our risk of death. There is a lot of um, different reasons um, affecting uh, or uh, factors that affect muscle health. And we will get uh, to touch upon uh, some of those today, but 
uh, especially physical activity, of course, and aging. So I think most of you are familiar with this figure or this photo that has been around for lots of years. We know that muscle mass declines with age. We call it sarcopenia. It's uh, when it's age-related uh, uh, loss of muscle uh, or muscle atrophy, we could call it. I won't go too much into sarcopenia. We will just call it loss of muscle mass today. I think it will make it um, uh, too complicated or uh, take off the, the focus of the talk. So just let's uh, stick to loss of muscle mass with aging. So this, this photo is a classical one. This one is also very classical. It's uh, from 2000. And here you can see different uh, photos of uh, cross-sectional areas from males and females of different ages. We also know that apart from reducing the cross-sectional area from, from um, around 20 to 80 years of age, we also increase our non-contract tissue uh, within the muscle, uh, also fat tissue actually. And um, that's why um, you can see that the, the pattern of, the, of, of these cross-sectional areas uh, decrease or, or changes with age. So not only do we lose muscle size, uh, we also lose muscle quality when these uh, um, uh, non-contractile uh, components are integrated in uh, or uh, substituted with the normal muscle tissue, of course. But just to, just to open the discussion here, I will show you two other um, photos of uh, cross-sectional areas of uh, two other um, individuals, one being a 17-year-old male triathlete, and one being at the bottom a 47-year-old a former elite athlete that got a spinal cord injured eight years previous to this uh, MRI scan. So as you can see uh, from this, these uh, photos, it's not only aging that is going on. Inactivity and muscle disuse is also uh, affecting it uh, a lot. And also exercise uh, being, uh, uh, as the example of the uh, elite athlete of 70 years old. So these are kind of the extremes. So, um, this is a more natural um, picture that we see in the, in the laboratory. Uh, it's uh, from two of my subjects. Uh, to the left, a 23-year-old male, and to the left or to the right, a uh, male uh, aged 72 years uh, old. And they have about the same activity level. But despite of that, you can see there is something going on in uh, the older um, um, male subject within the muscle, but also the muscle size. Of course, you can't just compare the two because we haven't uh, uh, pictures of those um, from from the older guy from when he was young. But these are just examples of uh, what is uh, more realistic uh, changes with age. Um, and um, despite I say they have the same activity level, maybe that's not uh, the total truth. Because when we ask people how how active they are, um, um, uh, from this study we were asking how, how many hours per week they were active. But as you may know, uh, especially if you are as old as I am, you know that you tend to move differently the older you get. So despite you you are pretty active, you, you, you tend to move in a different way from when you were a kid or when you were young. It is not very often that you run as fast as you can to the bus or to the car or when, wherever you go as when you were younger. So, so your, your um, movement patterns change when you get uh, older. And I think that could be part of the explanation for the changes we observe. So, um, so the big question with this talk and with much of my research has been to um, look into 
what is ex actually leading to sarcopenia or this uh, loss of muscle with aging? Is it really aging or is it uh, caused more by inactivity? And that is, of course, a bit difficult to, uh, to investigate because we don't follow our subjects for a, a lifetime. We don't have time for that. So much of our research data are actually based on cross-sectional data. But we know that um, there are Older individuals are just as different as younger individuals. Uh, there's a huge difference be between how um, frail elderly individuals, um, uh, how, how they age and how more active or even um, lifelong master athletes, how they age. And uh, with this, I'll just say that we have to open up our mindset towards the, uh, the, the uh, diversity of older individuals. So there's a huge difference between the chronological and the uh, biological age, uh, which of course leads to that. Um, so despite of how active, how healthy we are, there is some kind of decline with age, uh, no doubt of that. Uh, there are some, some factors we can't change, I will come to, into that. But um, the more physical active we are, um, the later we will reach a threshold for uh, independence. So the more inactive, the more diseased you are throughout your lifetime, uh, the much sooner you will reach the threshold for independence. So actually the goal, I think also for this longevity, um, whole idea of longevity is not just living longer, but also living a healthy uh, life also when you uh, in your old age. So if we just um, start out by looking at how aging affects uh, the muscle loss with aging, um, as I said, some things, there are some factors we can't change. And um, the best way of looking at that is actually to look at persons that are extremely uh, well-trained. So they are um, the opposite range of inactive. So uh, there are a certain breed of persons who have been training for their whole life and uh, they perform um, championships for master athletes. And we have to the right here, we have uh, time, time, 100 meter uh, sprint times for uh, males from 40 to 90 years of age. And as you can see, despite of these individuals being uh, uh, extremely well-trained, they get slower uh, with increasing age. But I will um, point out here that it, it's, not, um, it's not that it is just uh, the, the spring time is not increasing from the age of 40 in a linear way. It seems like something happens around uh, the age of 75, 80 years of age. And uh, I think you will acknowledge that from uh, many of the um, of other parameters. Something is really happening around the age of 80 that um, seems to be um, uh, very difficult uh, to, um, to counteract actually. But until that age, you can perform uh, fairly, um, similar to uh, people of younger age, also if you are a sprinter. So these were uh, super elite athletes. Um, uh, to look more into how uh, normal, more normal uh, people age, we have, uh, we have um, conducted a study in Copenhagen some years ago where we looked at uh, healthy individuals uh, in a cohort age, 20 to uh, 93 years of age. And we investigated uh, several factors that is included in the sarcopenia diagnose. So uh, we measured uh, uh, lean mass, muscle strength, muscle power, and physical function in all of these uh, individuals. and. Um, Somewhat to our surprise, um, they didn't actually behave as we had expected because uh, in contrast to 
to many other studies, uh, international studies in uh, um, uh, looking into sarcopenia, where you have a more mixed population, you investigate these uh, quite healthy individuals actually didn't lose very much muscle. Um, and that is explained uh, at the bottom row here where we have, so ALM is appendicoline mass. It's the muscle mass you have in your legs and your arms measured by DEXA. And the lower panels are controlled for height squared. So we control for size of the individual. And all in the next um, figures, all the gray areas will uh, correspond to um, two standard uh, deviations below what is normal for the young uh, individuals in this particular study. So that would be um, below uh, a threshold uh, of two standard deviations. So what we can see here to the left, where we have the, the results for the male population, you can see that they actually don't change that much with age. So uh, of course we have uh, a kind of a decline but it's not very, um, uh, it's not uh, uh, very marked. And as you may see there, uh, many of the very old individuals actually have the same muscle, uh, lean muscle mass as many of the young individuals. And, um, and the same were actually um, uh, the fact for, for the female population. So, in contrast to many other studies, uh, these individuals had a very, quite a low uh, uh, um, um, uh, not many of them actually had low muscle tissue or sarcopenia. Um, it's only in the ones in, in the gray area. And it was only individuals above the age of 70 in the male population that were significant uh, different from the younger population. And in the, in the female population, they had to be older than 80 years of, old, of, of age. So this um, loss of muscle isn't just, you know, uh, in, in many, uh, in, especially in many reviews, it's, it's noted that, um, that you lose muscle from the age of uh, 30 or 50, at, at a very uh, young age, actually, and we didn't see this in this healthy population. Uh, we also measured gait speed as a measure of function. Um, the same was there, um, a lot of variation, um, no chain, uh, no difference between uh, men and women. But here they were significant different uh, from the young population from the age of 70. And, and the, uh, I will explain why I say these numbers later. Hand grip strength as a measure of isometric uh, muscle strength. You can see that the curves are different. They are, uh, they are declining at a faster rate, um, especially in the males. And when we look at them, uh, more individuals are actually below the threshold for, for the younger population. And um, this, uh, when we, uh, this hand grip strength uh, were significantly different from the young population already from the age of 60. Um, more, even more interesting, it was um, another measure of uh, uh, combined function and muscle strength test, the sit to stand test uh, performed for uh, 30 seconds. Um, and here we saw even a uh, more uh, diverse pattern and uh, steeper decline in, um, in performance and uh, a difference from the young population already from the age of 50. So um, in contrast to what we actually um, expected. It wasn't muscle mass that were driving the loss of muscle strength in, uh, with aging. It was actually the opposite. Uh, the first, the most sensitive and the, the, uh, the, uh, um, the most sensitive marker of a, a very um, initial decline in, um, 
in muscle health was muscle power assessed by uh, this situ stand test, which was already different from the age of 50. And then uh, came muscle strength, function, and um, at a later age, muscle mass. We also looked into what was really driving this. Uh, and uh, also to our surprise, we didn't see a lot of information in these individuals. Um, um, in contrast to all our more frail uh, individuals or populations. So a um, uh, lot of what is um, actually um, suggested in the literature uh, driving muscle loss with age was, um, was not as um, um, clear with these uh, more healthy individuals, in, at least in this cohort. So from a longevity perspective, you, uh, you will be interested in uh, if there's a treatment for this. And of course there is a treatment and the short answer is that we have a pill called exercise. Um, it is extremely effect effective, especially if we add protein. Um, the next question is of course, um, what kind of exercise? and it does the type of exercise matters. And that is, um, in my perspective, extremely um, important because in, especially many medical doctors prescribe exercise and doesn't really care about what type of exercise um, people perform. And um, I think we should um, start to look at exercise actually um, in parallel with any other medicine because it's just as effective and as any other uh, medicine um, type, a dose and, um, and how many um, days per week you take it um, actually matters. And I will uh, show you a very classical uh, data from a very classical study here from uh, where, they, where they investigated um, um, the effect of lifelong training. And uh, first I will, if, if you look at the bars uh, or the figures uh, uh, down here, uh, you can see that um, they included uh, young individuals, young controls compared and uh, older controls, seven their uh, individuals. And uh, they measured uh, muscle cross-sectional area. Uh, so muscle size, and what they also did was that they also measured um, uh, the quality of the muscle. So size divided uh, or muscle strength divided by cross-sectional area as a marker of the muscle quality. And what was interesting was that um, they included three different types of um, older individuals that were um, lifelong swimmers, runners, and uh, individuals that perform strength training. And um, as you can see here, um, there's quite a difference between the types of, uh, of uh, training um, uh, interventions because um, it's only strength training that is actually compared, uh, comparable to, um, to what uh, to the muscle size of young individuals. So if you uh, uh, perform muscle or strength training as an older or have done that for a long, uh, for a long time as an older individual, you're, you actually don't have a smaller muscle size compared to younger individuals was that not uh, really the truth if you swim or run. Even more interestingly, um, um, with strength training, they, these older individuals were also able to maintain or even uh, perform better than the young controls when it came to muscle quality. This has been also shown in very old individuals. This is also a very classical study from uh, Maria Fiatarone, where they uh, demonstrated that resistance training is extremely effective. Um, so, so the short answer here that is that we need to perform strength training, um, maybe not free weights. We could do it on the more controlled and secure forms. And um, I think I will skip this. Um, um, no. So so that was it. Um, um, just 
touching upon uh, more controlled conditions of inactivity. I will just say very shortly that um, in in animals, we know that um, um, age related, there are age-related differences in, in how they respond to both atrophy and regrowth. So this is very um, important when it also comes to older individuals if they get hospitalized. Um, we have demonstrated that this is also actually the fact with uh, older individuals if we subject them to two weeks of uh, immobilization by a cast and afterwards uh, retraining. Um, we did see also to our surprise that actually young individuals lost more, but they also regained faster uh, compared to older individuals that were not able to um, regain what they lost within uh, four weeks of resistance training uh, after two weeks of immobilization. This was uh, caused by satellite cells. Um, um, and what was interesting here was that, um, so satellite cells are these myogenic muscle stem cells, which are very important for regrowth and hypertrophy. And what was actually the major uh, difference between old and, and young individuals was their ability to regain um, uh, the muscle um, size of the fib uh, the, the explosive uh, uh, muscle fibers, the type two fibers, and the number of satellite cells per uh, uh, that were um, connected to these type two fibers. So let me sum up here. Um, inactivity uh, strength training is. Uh, can preserve lean muscle mass and quality up to a very old age. Um, this is extremely uh, effective. Um, this use leads to a decreased muscle health and accelerated aging. So there's um, a kind of saying that use it or lose it. It's, uh, I mean, the most, the most dangerous thing you can do is not to move at all. Um, don't get immobilized. Um, and also, just one last point here is that um, we may include in our um, in our recommendation as uh, as physiotherapists and also as medical doctors that uh, older individuals uh, have an antigenated but not a blunted response to regrowth. So they may need a longer um, uh, uh, intervention to get back to normal if they uh, have been hospitalized for. Uh, some time. Other perspectives are that we may uh, measure these uh, different domains. Uh, the most sensitive uh, parameter, according to me, is the sit-to-stand test. It's easy, it's cheap, and uh, very closely linked to muscle power. And if you're interested in muscle power, I can recommend this paper by uh, Julian uh, Alcazar, where uh, it, where he demonstrates how you can um, get from the sit to stand test actually to muscle power per uh, body uh, weight. So um, with this, I will say thank you and acknowledge all my um, co-workers on this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Really acknowledging human muscle, which is very important. This is, by the way, the first webinar where we really talk and focus on, on human muscle. So thank you for that. I think you might, as listeners, have lots of questions. So please use the, um, uh, the Q&A uh, button where you put your questions in. Uh, and in the end, we will then ask uh, Charlotte, of course, these questions. Um, Charlotte, may, may I... May I just ask, why do we bother about muscle mass? There is lots of discussion in the field if we should measure muscle mass or muscle strength or physical function. And I think you really showed very nice data, convincing me at least, that maybe we should measure muscle function and not muscle mass. Tell me a little bit more about your thoughts. What really to measure? I think... Um, um... 
So, so uh, of course, the muscle quality, muscle strength matters, but there is also uh, an important issue with the, the size of the muscle. We need a reserve capacity if something happens. We, we also need something that can waste when we get above the age of 80. When it's difficult, when it's it 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 will get more and more difficult to maintain your muscle mass above the age of 80. And we know also that um, when we get older, um, we will get subjected to 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 um, to periods of disease, um, hospitalization, inactivity. Um, I mean, so so we need something that we can lose from. And um, another important point here is that um, the size of the muscle is also very important for metabolic function. So, so it is extremely important for muscle health. Um, but I merely see that um, the, the functional test, I mean, the situ stand test is excellent but is, it is more a marker of muscle strength, muscle power and muscle health, then um, it, I think we need, we need to focus also on muscle size because it's crucial for muscle health. It's directly uh, related to muscle strength. So as you saw from the swimmers, the runners, the, the quality of the muscle in the runners is very good, but the, the muscle size is smaller. So if, if they break a leg, if they get injured and uh, lose 10% of their muscle, they will, um, they will get in trouble quite, quite um, uh, bef uh, before uh, an individual that had uh, performed uh, resistance training. But you were saying muscle mass and muscle strength is more important at, at, at certain ages. So... Mm. Um, I think lots of people who are listening, they, they are 40 or 50. What should you really maintain? Should you maintain muscle mass? Should you maintain strength? Or is it so interrelated? And why are you hammering a little bit on the mass too? So you're saying that it's not only for contraction, but maybe also it's a metabolic organ. Are you, are you um, focusing uh, on that? Yeah, it is. It's extremely important as a, for, for metabolic health at, at as well, I mean, if if you don't have a lot of muscle, your insulin resistance will uh, decrease. I mean, you need the muscle to to get uh, the glucose out of the bloodstream. So the more, the better, actually. And um, yeah, and also for mental health, for uh, uh, bone health, there's a, a lot of uh, very good things to say about. I mean, you you need your your muscle tissue to be healthy, and you need a lot of it. Actually, the more, the better. Uh, and um, I'm not saying that cardiovascular uh, exercise is not doing any good. I, I think it's doing a lot of uh, good things. We know from uh, mitochondrial function, uh, cellular, I mean, cellular health, and a lot of other things. But I need, I, I think we need to um, to look into the exercise of uh, having different effects, just like any other medication. So you want to do some kind of balanced training if, if you need that. You want to do uh, uh, um, um, stretching, yoga, if you need that. You want to do some cardiovascular exercise uh, to maintain your, your um, cardiovascular system, but you also want to focus on your muscle health. And if you don't have much time, so not all have time to exercise every day, I think um, it's, it's, it's quite a, a good offer. I mean, it takes very short time to do resistant training. We, we will come back to the interventions in a, in a, in a second, but um, I think it's not yet really implemented that we are measuring muscle mass or muscle strength or muscle function in clinical practice. What, what do you see in Copenhagen Oh, or in Denmark, is it really implemented already? And then we are going to the interventions. Of course, I would like to know what I should do, in your opinion. Yes. Um, so we don't use um, muscle size. We don't measure it regularly. We are trying to implement it at the hospitals because we know it's uh, muscle mass is uh, just um, in, uh, just your mass, muscle mass is a very strong predictor of how how 
if you get complications uh, when you're hospitalized, if you, you, you know, um, you increase your mortality, a lot of other things. And um, so that is extremely important. Um, I think also for many, but now we are moving into patients. I think uh, when we are talking diseases for younger individuals, uh, they may lose their muscle mass uh, faster. I mean, if you, for example, get cancer, um, you won't you won't um, walk at a very slow uh, speed until you are much older, but you will lose a lot of muscle. So, so you need to measure muscle in many many uh, kinds of diseases in younger individuals. And in geriatric medicine, uh, we have been quite focused on individuals above the age of eight, uh, 65, of course, and that's where sarcopenia actually were founded. But I think we are um, we need to also focus on uh, younger patient groups. I mean, could be uh, arthritis. Uh, I mean, lots, lots of diseases are affected on the muscle tissue. And, uh, and um, because of that, also life quality, yeah. And, and can you um, elaborate a little bit more about the discrepancy sometimes with weight and how much muscle mass we have? So is, do, can we also measure BMI to, to think about or to, to if we want to oh, measure yes. muscle, muscle health? And um, yeah. that's my first question. The second one, could you also think, are, is, is there a difference between different ethnicities who sometimes have different body compositions? Mm. So... So uh, you're saying body composition. So of course we can't just see from from the outside how people look on the inside. We know that, and uh, so it is um, it is important to um, to measure either. I mean, if uh, normally we do it with a DEXA scan, we can do it um, more easily and applicable with uh, bioimpedance. It's very easy and much cheaper. Not as good, but it's it's doable, and um, and that is um, quite important because because um, body composition changes with inactivity, with many kinds of diseases, and, and uh, it is affecting muscle health a lot. So did that? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So you brought a couple of um, equipments in. So a DEXA yeah. and a BIA, how we were measure in, in BI, uh, of the BMI is absolutely, of course, not, um, no. not, not the one to measure. Um, let me ask you, it seems that uh, also the super agers who are very physically active and doing lots of um, sports during the lifetime, they do not escape <laughs> no. muscle mass and muscle strength and physical function is, um, is declining. So do, do you know what a possible secret could be to maintain muscle mass next, of course, to exercise, but they're already exercising. So what is the secret that they are still declining? What we, can we learn? Um. I think it at, at this point it's it's uh, quite difficult to answer because um, five years ago I would have say that uh, there's uh, the factor that we can't change is uh, the uh, the changes that is uh, going on in the in the nervous system, but actually we also um, seeing now data coming up that we can also maintain a lot of uh, the factors that actually. Um, normally hypothesized that we're driving sarcopenia um, at old age as well. Uh, I, yeah, so, but that's one of the difficult factors to counteract. So there's a lot of uh, changes going on uh, in the neuromuscular system with very at a very old age so there's a complete remodeling of the muscle uh, fibers and the motor neurons in the in the muscle so that's difficult but there are some emerging data coming out that if you do resistance training lifelong you can also maintain that better than if you don't okay so before opening it up um, to the questions from the audience let me ask you 
uh, and a last question. Mm. So what is the ideal protocol if somebody is at the age of 50, want to stay healthy? What is the, 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 the protocol actually to increase muscle mass, muscle strength and physical function at that age without any other disease? So you, uh, if you, if you want to increase, increase your muscle mass, you, you need to do resistance training. So, so that's, that's very easy. So you can do many things to maintain your muscle mass. So you don't have to do resistance training to maintain your muscle mass. But if, at a, at, I mean, at least until uh, the age of 70 or 75, but if you want to increase it, you need to um, provoke the system to get it, uh, to make it stronger. And it's not, it's not um, unimportant at what intensity. So you can increase your, your uh, muscle size with low load resistance training uh, if you do it to failure, if you're familiar with that. But if you want to provoke or train the, the neural system, it is much more effective or, um, to, to do heavy resistance training. That's the only way where you also affect the brain and the, the, um, uh, the interplay between muscle and uh, neurons and brain yeah so are you saying that if i want to maintain my muscle mass i have at the moment due to my swimming mm -hmm. i don't have to do resistance exercise training and that's what i'm saying yes i think you can you know there's a huge difference between if you want to maintain a level or if you want to uh, uh, another level so hypertrophy is another thing but i think uh, when you get a little older uh, now you're quite young, I know. So um, the older you get, the more you have to drive your uh, exercise towards strength training. Okay, I think we have to open it up for because otherwise it will be very personal. So <laughs> I will give the floor to um, Lim uh, Xu Xiang, who is also a research fellow in our uh, Center for Healthy Longevity. So happy to hear all the other questions. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, so um, we have some questions from the audience and you mentioned at the start of your uh, presentation about inactivity and all. So some of the audiences are wondering like, what, when, when is a person considered inactive and what are some of the ways to measure inactivity? And that's a good question. Um, and I'm sorry, I, um, I, the time slipped for me. So I didn't go very much into um, the last studies, but um, so it is difficult to control for inactivity. Of course, you would wear uh, wearables and measure physical activity or um, how active people are. But what we did with these immobilization studies was that we tried to control. So we, we recruited physically equally active young and old individuals, and then, then we immobilized them. So, so that's a very controlled condition. Yeah, free living people is like um, yeah, the wild type animal. It's difficult, um, but um, yeah. So it's easier if you uh, do it under controlled situations. Yeah, I haven't done large scale inactivity studies. I've, I've tried to focus on these controlled conditions. So is inactive less than 10,000 steps? It could be, yeah, you could say that. Yeah. So that's all of us, I think. <laughs> so um, in terms of muscle loss with aging, so some of the audience are actually curious, like when you talk about the muscle loss, which type of muscle starts to lose first with aging? So, so you tend to lose your uh, muscle mass in the legs first. So, and that's where um, most research has focused because that's, um, the leg muscles are uh, the ones that um, makes you independent. If you, if you can't rise from a chair, you can't live independently. So, so and yeah, it makes sense. It's easy to measure the cordyceps muscle. Uh, you can take biopsies from it repeatedly. You can uh, assess it very easily. So uh, that's, that's one reason, but also because it's so important for your locomotion, I think. So... Yeah. 
So Charlotte, why, why do we lose muscle mass and muscle strength in your legs? Um, despite that we are using these kind of muscles much more maybe than our arms. But we don't. So um, it's completely the opposite. We know that the more inactive we are, we uh, use our arms more and our legs less. So, um, and um, the, the different skeletal muscles are also com have a different composition of uh, the ratio of type one and type two fibers are different. So the type, uh, the muscles with more type two fibers decrease more rapidly than the others. The, the cordyceps muscles is kind of a mixed muscle. So uh, actually the, the lower limb muscles, uh, they atrophy faster than the cordyceps muscle. And yeah, but that's leg muscles, uh, they decrease faster than the arms. Yeah. Some of the audience are actually interested to find out like, why is there actually a gender difference in muscle loss across age? Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. Um, we did see that, um, and that's um, not only us, all know that, um, so the muscle size or the lean tissue mass of, of male individuals are much larger than of uh, female. Uh, women so um so there's you have more to lose there's a steeper decline in male individuals um so it could be then uh, one reason could be that the less you have the less you lose and the uh, the more difficult it is to, to see a difference but the difference wasn't that i mean it was uh, above the age of 70 in men and above the age of 80 in women. But I, I, I would also um, uh, be a bit cautious about that because we didn't have many individuals that were very old. So, so I, I don't know if, um, yeah, I can say that for sure. So, so it's not good to be a female. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's this awful because one. you start out the, the the less you have from to start out the the, the more frail you will get, and we also see that. Uh, yeah. I, I just heard we have 58 questions left, so I will give okay. back the floor. <laughs> short questions, short answers. <laughs> so, um, in terms of the strength training, are, are they actually? current recommendations of how, like you mentioned about the type and intensity. So they are, the audience yeah. are quite interested in like yeah. the recommendation. The, there are very good recommendations in the American uh, Society of Sports Medicine. So they, they are very, um, there's uh, some very nice guidelines to how to um, prescribe this type of exercise in older individuals. So, so ACSM, American Society of Sports Medicine. Hmm. Regarding to strength training, so actually some of the audience are actually concerned with people like having knee pain or hip, hip pain, and you actually recommended the uh, sit to stand test to test for strength. So if that is the case, will there be other possible tests that people in the clinical con uh, population can use apart from that? Yeah, so the hand grip strength, you can uh, almost everybody can use that. So that's uh, a good, reliable measure if if uh, they can't perform the sit to stand test. So I think you should do both. They show different uh, things if you can. You, you mentioned that there's actually more the accelerated rate of uh, it, uh, muscle loss at, after the age of 80. Mm -hmm. So would that recommendation be different from a younger? person in terms of exercise and in terms of diet yes so we know there's a anabolic resistance in at older age the older the more so you need more protein because uh, to to um, uh, the protein uptake decreases with uh, increasing age so so older individuals um, are actually um, uh, recommended to eat uh, about uh, about uh, 1.5 grams protein per kilogram body weight or even more the more the better actually um per day um, so that's quite a lot so so you you have to take care of what you eat and um, the recommendation will be about 
two to three times per week, not more, because you have to be able to restitute between between your exercises. So twice a week is fine. Sometimes three times, but twice is fine. And in terms of the strength uh, training that you you actually recommended, so some uh, of the audience also asked about power training. Right? What are your yeah. views on that? So that's a good question. And uh, power training uh, is effective. So power training is when you you lift a load uh, the f as fast as you can, and it's a lower load than you use in heavy resistance training. So um, you also train your your muscular system. You you um, uh, with this type of training, but um, the good thing about heavy resistance training is that you get exactly the same stimulus uh, with just lifting heavy weights because you recruit so many muscle fibers at the same time. And uh, power, power training can be, um, um, you can get injured quite easy compared to more controlled uh, uh, control conditions with uh, resistance training. Would there be other, um... Apart from exercise and uh, nutrition-wise, are there actually other interventions that uh, people can consider to prevent muscle loss? I, I, they are by far the most effective. You, you could also stimulate your muscle tissue in another way. If you can't move uh, for some reason, if you're hospitalized, you could use electrical stimulation of your muscle to maintain muscle uh, size or mass. Uh, it is not as effective, but it's enough to maintain your muscle mass. But um, if you can move, if you can exercise, this is far uh, much better, yeah. So with the electrical stimulation, is that meant for um, anyone or is it just for immobilized um, patients? And Anyone can use it, but it's it it, it makes most sense if you're immobilized because you're actually exercising is so much more effective. So it's it kind of wasting your time if you can exercise. And there are some questions regarding like hormonal uh, uh, ingestion. So they're wondering what your thoughts are on like testosterone and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's it's an exciting area. Um, well, one of my colleagues is performing a study where she's um, giving uh, old uh, older um, men um, testosterone injections and exercise. And um, you know there have been a lot of uh, precautions about um, testosterone uh, injections, of course, because um, there were some some a few studies that show that it may increase the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, there are also of course uh, worries about um, uh, cancer development but um, I think you no know, maybe in the future for the right people in the right doses so micro doses in a short term um, intervention after an operation could be a possible uh, way to to work around it. So for short duration, small doses and then exercise on top could be um, interesting to try out. Uh, but it, it, there's not much data on it. In terms of like you, you mentioned about protein just now, mm -hmm. and uh, the audience were actually quite curious about what kind of pro what source of proteins would you actually recommend so uh, just the, i think the easiest way is just to eat healthy you no know, uh, get your proteins from your regular diet because uh, protein supplements are not tasting uh, that well but uh, yeah you can if you you have to uh, think about it if, if it's from plant uh, protein it's not as effective but uh, i mean um most most um, sources work yeah good thank you so much so many so many questions um <laughs> well
for the ones who, who didn't really realize my power was off. So I'm on again and I'm now closing uh, this meeting. And of course, we would really like to get your feedback. So please use that in the panelists and all attendees uh, uh, box. So Charlotte, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today. And I would like you to remind uh, yourself to sign up for our next webinar. Um, and it's in the chat room, the link or um, watch our next email, we will send you one. Um, the next webinar is on September 2nd, and with us will be Tyler uh, Golato, and um, he will talk about uh, funding for longevity research, which is, of course, for most of us here in the room, dear to our heart. So thank you very much for your participation today, and uh, we will close the webinar with a lesson from an aging lady, and she wonderfully states, or I find it very wonderful, there is a difference between growing old and growing up. So hopefully you are taking care of yourself being grown ups. Thanks. Before you enter the real world, there's some words of wisdom that I'd like to share with you. We don't stop playing because we're old. We get old because we stop playing. Make sense? There's a huge difference between <laughs> growing old and growing up. I could stay in bed for a year. I'm 81, so I'll be 82. You can stay in bed, you'll be 20. What are you gonna be in a year? You're gonna be 21. Anybody can grow old. The trick is to seek possibility and growth and use that time and love that time. We elderly people we don't regret what we did. We regret what we didn't do. The only people who fear death are those who have regrets. And remember, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down.